Hey, what's going on gamers? It's not that much left until 2024. So before the year ends, I wanted to make a video and tell about the latest changes in my game. But first, I really wanted to thank all of you for helping me to reach 1000 subscriber milestone. I still can't believe I have 1000 subscribers. Had no idea people would be interested in watching videos about some guy rambling in broken English about some boring game he makes for a 40 year old system. No, but seriously, thank you guys. It's the best Christmas present for me. Okay, now let's see how my NES game is doing. As usual, if you want to check it out for yourself, you can grab the ROM from the links that are in the description. My last video comments helped me to realize that the entrance in the cave that leads to the crash site looks more than some sort of a glitch than an obvious destination where you need to go. So I just had to fix it as soon as possible. I decided to move the cave maps to the same bank as the alien base. So these maps would also use the same tile set as the base. This way I could add more graphics to the cave since I could not add any new tiles to the main tile set. I gave the cave a makeover of some sort. So now you can see the light seeping through where the entrance to the crash site is. So you might wonder what the heck is it? And hopefully you might want to go there. I needed to somehow explain who lived in the house that is now taken over by our main character. Where the heck is this person? So I added a room to the left of the cave's entrance and put some items there. But also the remains of an unfortunate guy who ventured to the cave. So he is the owner of the house. This is an actual NPC here, but a different kind. The one that doesn't move, but it moved at the beginning. While working I realized that cheat codes can be really handy. You don't need to open the debugger every time you want to add some item to your inventory. You can put the code in like the immortality or the item you need and do the testing that way. I've never tried to create Game Genie codes before, so it was something new for me. As you probably know, the Game Genie was an unofficial hardware add-on that led to to modify your game's ROM memory by entering a code that consists of 6 or 8 characters. First I tried to come up with a 6 character code that grants me immortality. So I needed to find a place in my assembly code where I could change a single byte to achieve my goal. But apparently due to the fact that my game constantly switches banks, my code didn't work. So I tried to create a 8 character code. This longer code has a comparison byte which used to compare the contents of an address you want to change. For some reason this didn't work as well. Perhaps different banks had the same value at the same address? Anyways, I did not want to mess around with Game Genie codes any longer. Why can't I just make a simple raw code that modifies not the ROM but the RAM memory? It would be much easier because I would be modifying the variable values that are in the RAM and not the actual code that's in the ROM. So I came up with two codes. First one grants me immortality and the second one adds an hammer to my inventory that I could use to clear the entrance to the crash site. Actually this last code can be modified to get you any item you want. I don't know though if it's possible to use these codes on the EverDrive but it's quite easy to apply them on a decent emulator like Messon. While testing I found a huge bug. Well I was aware of it before but for some reason I didn't do anything about it. At some point I even believed that I fixed it but unfortunately no it was still there. And it was the radio at the crash site or to be exact the lack of it. Imagine you suffered everything that the game threw at you and you finally reach the crash site you see that the, the end goal item is missing. Well you might not even have a clue that there's supposed to be something there. Like okay you found the plane but 
Now what? The radio was missing because of the flawed item respawning. The radio wasn't stored in the RAM as a fresh item that wasn't taken by the player. So the game thought that it was already gone and didn't spawn it. To fix the issue I arranged my locations in two groups. One group that has respawnable items and the second one that has not. So if the location doesn't have respawnable items, like the crash set in this case, then the respawn routine would not be activated. And the items will definitely be there when you enter that location for the first time. Also talking about the crash site, I added an additional screen to it. So when you enter from the cave, the plane is no longer straight into your face. You need to go a bit to the right. As I promised in my last video, I wanted to fix how the NPCs are facing the player while attacking. Previously, the problem existed because the NPCs only had four direction frames, but they could have one of eight movement directions. So usually if an NPC had some diagonal direction, the game would not know which frame to use and would pick the worst frame possible. So now before the NPC starts attacking, I am trying to pick the best frame for the current direction it has. Of course it's not perfect now, but I think it's a bit better. Guess what happened next? I ran out of free space in the main bank again. So once again I needed to figure out how to free it up. Mainly by moving chunks of code to other banks without causing major glitches. At this point I already knew that it's impossible to keep certain banks for like specific things I had before. For instance, a separate bank for menu, screen and separate bank for the audio. Now everything is getting mixed up together. For example, I moved a reasonable amount of code that doesn't have anything to do with menus to the bank that was previously used only for the menu screen. Talking about the menu screen, I decided to get rid of the menu options that are inactive or not working. For instance, like the store option when you're outside of your house or the cook option when you can't actually cook anything and so on. I hope that's going to make the menus less confusing and reduce the decision fatigue. So you no longer need to ponder what would happen if you pick a cook option when the food is already cooked. Then I spent some time on the quests. Not sure if it's a good idea, but I really wanted to force the player to complete every quest for each villager. Or at least to talk to all villagers. The best way to do that, in my opinion, was to stop incrementing the quest index until a special quest is complete for that villager. So the villager would remind you that you need to complete his or hers special quest. Previously the single special quest was the delivery of a pie from Hedgehog Lady to the Granny. Now I added two more special quests. One where you deliver a jar of jam from Granny to Bjorn and the second one where you bring a letter from the cave that is written by that missing villager. You need to deliver that letter to Hedgehog Lady. Unfortunately, you can't read the letter yet, but I'm working on it. So most of these special quests must be completed before the last fourth villager quest. So for instance, if you don't deliver the jar of jam to Bjorn, you won't be able to activate the final quest where you get the hammer as a reward and you won't be able to reach the crash site and complete the game. Then I decided that it was finally time to fix a very old issue where the color attributes are not restored after you close the menu screen. Sometimes after closing the screen you might encounter some weirdly colored areas. But most of the times you might not even notice that something is wrong. Mainly because the map looks the same everywhere. So I guess that's partly the main reason why I ignored this issue for so long. And also partly because the screen restoration code was so big and insanely convoluted. I literally had to sit down for a day and carefully read every line and even leave comments after each one of those lines because I already could no longer tell what's going on there. It felt as if I was trying to clean 
some abandoned basement of some insane hoarder. The final result, even though it might not be as noticeable to you, but to me it felt really satisfying, as if I achieved something awesome. I also discovered that I missed few bugs that were related to the fishing rod. First of all, you could cast the fishing rod inside of the alien base, as if it's some kind of a giant lake. And also you could equip some other item while the rod is already casted. It was too funny and I could not understand why I missed that. Also, you might know that I had more than one complaint about the food stat. How it's running out way too fast and it's impossible to explore anything without dying from hunger. I mean, wh wh what did you expect? You're playing the game called Cold and Starving. Come on, it's the game about starving to death. Okay, I'm kidding. I'm not that heartless, but I'm not that good at balancing games either. The main character has this super fast metabolism, mainly because at the beginning there was not much to do, but hunt bunnies and eat them. Now I try to reduce the hunger speed. Also I made that it would be possible to get food points by eating raw meat. I kinda didn't want to add that earlier because I didn't want to create a zombie simulator where you chow down on raw bunny innards. Still eating just the raw meat is not a very good strategy, it might just save you in very dire moments. Lastly I got very nostalgic about an old emulator that I used to play NES games on my first PC. It's Nesticle. I don't know, maybe some of you also used it in the 90s. I was really curious, could it actually run my game? Surprise, surprise, it could not. The game crashed just after the intro cutscene. What's also interesting, the same behavior could be observed on the NES emulator on the Nintendo DS. Are they somehow related? Sure, I had no intentions to fix my game so it would work on some ancient emulator. But I was really curious. Why my game is so special and doesn't work? I don't think I am doing something extraordinary here. It appears Nesticle could not properly emulate the Sprite Zero. The Sprite Zero is the first sprite of the 64 hardware sprites that the NES has. The sprite can be used to achieve such things as this status bar in my game. You simply load your HUD tiles and place the sprite somewhere in your HUD. And then you only scroll the screen when the scan line is collided with this sprite. For instance, in Super Mario Bros, this sprite is this coin you can see in the top of the screen. So this way the status bar cannot be affected by the scrolling and would stay in the same place. As soon as I commented out the code that waits for the Sprite Zero collision, my game started working. Of course only the status bar no longer remained still while the screen was scrolling. You might ask how come other NES titles work on the Nesticle without such issues. It looks to me that this emulator simply went through the ROM and searched for a particular pattern of code and then tried mimicking the behavior of the Sprite Zero. But it wasn't the proper emulation. Apparently it does not like the code that I put at the beginning and at the end of the NMI where I push register values to the stack. It seems most of the old NES titles didn't do that. If I remove those instructions, the emulator would start detecting that I actually have a HUD at the top of the screen. And I even managed to get the episode 2 code running almost flawlessly. Unfortunately, it was impossible to achieve the same results with the later iterations of the game. So yeah, looks like I won't be able to play my game on this emulator after all. But it was really fun to mess around. And that's all I wanted to share, if you're interested in my further progress and when the heck this game will be finally finished, then please subscribe the channel. So thanks for watching and I will see you next year. Bye.